So uh, thinking this afternoon particularly really about um, this question of how um, as church leaders uh, we empower people and create uh, these disciple-making churches. And uh, so here's a quote from one of our key um, mission leaders, probably uh, maybe world famous, maybe not, uh, Bishop Graham Cray. Led, uh, and he, we've done a lot of work with Graham. Um, but uh, this is what he says. Churches have to realize that the core of their calling is to be disciple-making communities, whatever else they do. And uh, that's actually quite a radical thing to say, curiously. And it's even more interesting when you know that he's the guy who does fresh expressions. So he, he doesn't care, in a, in a sense, what kind of church form you have. You can be bungee jumping church. You can be church from Gravesend to Waterloo. You can be, you know, ch church in a balloon. You can be, you know, traditional church, whatever it might be. But whatever kind of church, in the end, you've got to make disciples. However you get people together, in the end, it's, it's, it's intended to be a disciple-making uh, community. And uh, we began to talk about really how do we give people a biblical imagination for their daily context, how we get them to see their context uh, differently, help them to read their lives through a biblical lens, and so on. And part of that was uh, talking about the 6M, some of you more familiar than others. And when I said about the eight weeks, I, 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 I just assumed, of course, that you know, everybody knew about the DVD course, which is also available online. It's an eight-session course, and that's what people do. So either they do it from a, within a church service or they're with preaching around it or they do it on their own. And this is the thing that's changed church cultures. And, uh, you know, people are doing research on it. Globally, there's one guy out of uh, Gordon Conwell uh, associated with um, Ken Barnes and Lindsay McDonald doing uh, Macmillan doing research on it because it, it seems to be doing something. And again, you don't have to use it, but the principles behind it, soaking people, giving people long enough to work it out for themselves in community is the key. You can teach this in 30 minutes, the whole thing, but you can't get people to do it in 30 minutes. And that's a, a key, key issue. So eyes to see, as we said. So one of the questions is what, how can what we do in the five to 10 hours when we're gathered together, if you like, that's the, the British stats, how can that really equip, empower, um, encourage, exhort people for the 110 hours that they're apart. What begins to happen when that happens, when people see their contacts in that way? So I'm not going to tell you lots of stories, but I'm going to tell you one story to begin with. So this man called uh, Adrian McCartney. Uh, he's a supply teacher. That is, he comes in when other teachers aren't there and works uh, in the, what we call the secondary school system, so 11 to 18. And... Um, like many teachers, he would set somebody some work and, uh, and then he would wander up and down between the desks and occasionally would stop at somebody and he'd glance, oh, you're playing World of Warcraft, thanks for paying attention. <laughs> uh, and check that, check that they're doing the right thing and so on and so forth. He's not playing World of Warcraft, it's perfectly all right. He's actually writing a sermon, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so it goes on, how to alienate people. Um, anyway, so he'd do that, and actually, he, when he would stop at a desk, um, he would actually often be praying for somebody by name. He'd just stand there, he'd pray for them by name, silently, of course, but there he, that's what he would do. And one day, he's walking up and down the class, and he stops at uh, stops somebody who's praying for this person by name, and then he hears the Lord say to him, not audibly, but the Lord says to him, no one has ever mentioned that boy's name to me before. And, uh, you know, we, we could probably riff on that for half an hour, couldn't we? Um, but actually, that's, that's going to be more and more true. No Christian midwife before the child was named held that child in her arms or his arms and blessed it. No doctor prayed for it. No health visitor prayed for that child. No, do you have lollipop men or women who, you know, no lollipop person as that child was going to school when they were three years old and was crossing the road, prayed for that person. No teacher, no godparent, no parent, no sweet shop owner, no bus driver. No one prayed for that child. And yet Adrian did. And what, never what an encouragement. It's almost like God has these 7.5 billion computer screens up there. And he's waiting, you know, he's listening all to everything as he is. And then it bips on this screen. Boof. Well, at least that. At least that for anybody. We can do that. Anybody can do that. 
at least that. If we believed in the power of prayer, we believe that God is listening, that God is doing something, God answers prayer, well, at least that. So this is really just about stretching the imagination. This is a story of a, a woman called Jane, and she's, uh, she's a, a night manager in the hotel business. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's interesting, I don't know if you know this, but I didn't, one thing that's interesting about night managers is they often have to do lots of different things because there's not many other people around. So if the computer system breaks down, there is no IT person. Um, if this doesn't work, there is nobody. To, you've got you've to gotta, gotta deal with it. And, uh, She's rather a, a direct, I mean, direct kind of human. And uh, somehow she's, you know, somebody's computer doesn't work, so she prayed. And it started working. <laughs> and then, you know, there was another time when I think she was on a different shift. Uh, they were winding her up, and somebody came up to say, but true story, by the way. The, I only tell true stories. <laughs> uh, and I, I, and I, I, yeah, I only tell true stories. So, so the vending machine doesn't work. Somebody has put their money in the vending machine, ever had that happen to you, and nothing comes out. The Coke does not come out. So <laughs> send someone to Jane. So they say to Jane, Jane, would you come and uh, pray for the machine? <laughs> she doesn't even get to, in Jesus' name, and the can falls down. <laughs> so anyway, one day, one day, um, it's, it's, it's night time and the safe doesn't, the safe won't open. They can't open the safe, but they need to open the safe. They've got to put something in there. So they ask her, can you come and uh, open the safe? So she comes and prays and the safe opens. And then you know, puts stuff in and the safe closed. But the point is, when it's the safe, it, it has to be recorded in the incident book. Because certain things, if there's an incident, and, and open, you know, that, that is a serious thing, because it's financial stewardship. So her, uh, she was about to leave, and, and then the following week, her replacement comes in and they're doing the handover and they're going over the incident book <laughs> and he reads the safe would not open Jane pray <laughs> what's interesting though about that apart from the fact that it's amazing but why not there's an axe head at the bottom of the pool Elisha lifts it up what's interesting is that the people came to her that the possibility that people would come and ask for prayer other than for, say, a therapeutic question or a mental health or a physical health question, it's, it's possible. I'm not saying that it happens everywhere, and obviously the Lord is working through here, through her, rather. Now, I, I just want to give you a sense of the scope here. I'm going to do really six minutes on this, so don't, don't panic, um, on a passage of Scripture which you're probably familiar with. Um, just to give you an example of what I mean by the, the potential scope of our people's ministry out in the world. What's the scope of it? What could happen out there? What does happen out there? What might happen out there? And as you know, there are lots of examples in the New Testament of how, if you like, disciples engage with those who don't know Jesus. And we've got lots of examples of that. And, uh, and I wonder which one might kind of dominate in uh, your church. I wonder which one might dominate in your church. For a long time in my, my church, I think what we've had is, um, sorry, that's the safe, that's the incident that comes. What we've had is this one, come and see. So bring people along, bring them to the Alpha Supper or the Christianity Explored or whichever other groups of people I need to not offend by not mentioning <laughs> their evangelistic tool. Bring them to, along to that, bring them along to the carol service. Bring, you know, bring, them, bring them in, bring them to karaoke evening, the quiz evening, bring them along. You know, come to the, the barbecue, which in England you wouldn't recognize, it's just a little flame, you know, but <laughs> in the rain under an umbrella. Uh, but you know, that sort of stuff, come and see. And it's great, isn't it? That's what, that's what happens. Philip says to Antar, come and see. And that is a vital ministry, and, and let's not diminish it. Some people are really good at that, and, and praise God for it. But uh, what I'd like to look at is what you might call late Paul. Paul on his uh, voyage to Rome under arrest, as you may recall. And usually when we see Paul, we see him in situations um, which are kind of one-off. I mean, he's, he teaches for a long time in the Hall of Tyrannus, a long time in one location there, but that's kind of seems to be 
not so much evangelistic as, as discipling teaching. But, you know, we've seen on Mars Hill, we see him, you know, in the marketplaces and so on and so forth. But here is Paul, as you may recall, on this journey in the boat. And uh, there are 273 non-believers on this boat. And there's him, Luke, and Aristarchus. So it's three out of 273, 1% of the population. Now, there are workplaces like that, probably. And certainly schools like that and unis like that. You know, you're a very small number of people in there, 1% of the population. And he's there for a prolonged period of time because the voyage, as you know, is quite long. They go from here to there to there and so on and so forth. And what do we see? Well, first of all, we see that Paul builds a good relationship with the centurion, is the person who's charged with taking him to Rome uh, because the centurion lets him spend some time with his friends. So there's a good relationship there. And then uh, imagine for a moment that you're Paul and, uh, you know, it's uh, late September, October and you're praying and God gives you a vital message. He gives you a message. I don't know if you recall the passage. Gives you a message for the centurion, the pilot and the owner of the boat. And the message is, if you sail on, this boat is going down. So they sail on. They ignore his advice. Notice that Paul is speaking to three types of power. He's speaking to political power or military power in the centurion. He's speaking to power of ownership, financial power in the owner. And he's speaking to the power of expertise in the pilot. So yes, it's late in the year, but those other people think it's okay to take the risk. So it's not obvious. I think the text is clear that this, this comes from above. That the conviction that they will go down comes from above, not the conviction that it's risky. Conviction is risky, everybody knew it was risky, but that they will go down comes from above. So you set sail and you, Paul, now know that this business, this enterprise, is going into liquidation, if you like. I'm glad somebody appreciated the beauty of that pun. I thought I'd just let it sink in. Uh, but yes, no, it's bad news, isn't it? Um, but I don't want to carry on with any sea level jokes. Yeah, yeah, okay, there we go. That's enough, isn't it? It's surely enough. So what, what are you doing now? You're in an enterprise where things are not going well. What do you imagine Paul is doing? I imagine he's praying like mad. I imagine he's praying like mad because he knows what's going to happen and he's on this boat. Maybe you pray for a whale to come and pick you and Luke and Aristarchus up and just drop you at the mouth of the Tiber. We've done this before. And for the preachers among you, yeah, there's a load of stuff in here about Jonah and a load of parallels with Jesus in the boat and stuff, and it's very, very rich. But the context is a man in, a, in, a, in somebody else's workplace, and there's a problem. That's the physical context. So what does Paul do? He prays for their mortal lives. He prays holistically, not just their eternal life. He encourages them emotionally by telling them that not one of them is going to die. What an extraordinary idea in the middle of this storm. And he witnesses clearly to them, witnesses clearly, by telling them the source of this extraordinary confidence. An angel of the Lord has come to tell him this. That is extraordinary in a number of ways. So he witnesses clearly. He strengthens them physically by encouraging them to eat, something they hadn't done for days. He protects them practically. When the crew tries to leave, the, the sailors try to leave, he tells the centurion, don't let them leave, otherwise we're really in trouble. And this time the centurion takes his advice. In other words, he has, he's gained credibility. What's interesting to me is that uh, Paul is under enormous stress here. You know, this is a storm that goes on for weeks. The sun is blotted out. His, his stomach is in his cranium for days and days and days, and yet he's still got the capacity to think missionally, to think ministry, to think grace, to think love, to think hope, to think salvation far beyond himself. So I wonder whether we have uh, the same kind of, if you like, multi-dimensional vision for um, the, our people, the people that God has given you to um, <coughs> disciple in the places, in the boats, if you like, that they're in, wherever that might be. Um, there's a difference, isn't there, between a missional church and a mission all church. Thank you, I quite like that. <laughs> yeah, I haven't used that very often before. And it's, it's give me the affirmation, I think I've probably given another go. <laughs> Now, I would say, um, 
because what we're talking about here, and uh, you know, in a sense, uh, riffing off a little bit off some of the things that Eugene was saying, what we are talking about is a shift in culture, in the expectations of, of congregations and in the priorities of leaders. And I would say a little bit about that. See, a lot of churches, uh, we find, have a plan and a vision about how the church is going to grow. I remember talking to a group of leaders and, you know, and I asked them this question, which is a different question. So in three years' time, if you carry on discipling the people or doing what you're doing with the people, what will have changed for your people? Will they be any more better briefed? Will they be any more better trained? Will they be better resourced? Will they be, have been commissioned and will they be supported? Not many churches have a vision for the growth of the discipleship of their people. They have a three-year plan about how big we're going to be, when we're going to build a building, when we're putting in the jacuzzi, how we're going to get a 150-piece band in, where we're going to get a liturgical um, dance group, and so on and so forth. But very rarely, honestly, something which says, how are my people going to be, have grown over this time? They're here. How do we get them to there? So what we are engaged in, and the answer to that question, by the way, is one step at a time and quite slowly. <laughs> what we are engaged in and what we've found um, um, in the UK, and as um, there were, I think, six or seven representatives from Australia came to our international forum. So this is being trialled and developed in Australia, um, not just in Queensland, you know, in the boonies up in Queensland, but in sophisticated places too. <laughs> so, um, you know, yes, it's English. It may not work for you, but hopefully there'll be some ideas for you. It's, it is working in English-speaking cultures, including South Africa and including some very large churches. So I want to say a few little things about ch culture change. Um, so... As you've often heard, culture is the way we do things around here. That's one uh, Liverpool bishop, um, Derek Warlock. A lot of people have said that. Culture is the way we do things around here. And as I've discovered, you do some things differently in Australia than we do in the UK. And um, uh, the story goes that there was a group of Vatican prelates who went to Liverpool to talk to Archbishop Warlock about culture. And they came back to Rome and the Pope said to them, so, what's culture? And they said... Culture is the way they do things in Liverpool. <laughs> Which is not quite understanding. So culture is, in the end, the concrete manifestation of our beliefs. That is to say, our core values, uh, in the end, affect what we do. Ethos creates praxis, beliefs create behavior, and so on. The systems, the structures, the priorities, the behavior, the heroes. So you can tell who the heroes are, what's important to a, any community, to a family, to a church, to a workplace, by who the heroes are. Who gets, in Eugene's phrase, the stage time? <coughs> who gets held up? Who, what are the prizes for? And what we're looking to try to do is to align this with Christian values. And I would say what we're trying to do is to align this with whole life values. So the question is, is the way we do things round in our community, and every community will be different in the way that they approach these questions, is that likely to lead to whole life disciples? Is it likely? Or is it unlikely? So my church, which is a growing church, Bible teaching church, not particularly expository, that's not a Christian, it's just the way that it is, wonderful sung, sung, sung worship, vibrant prayer ministry, good social action, had not done any evangelism training in nine and a half years. But there's nothing wrong because the church has grown from 17, 20 years ago to seven or 800 today. But there is something wrong. And they've just got this. Literally six weeks ago, as it happened to be me, I taught the first thing on engaging culture and evangelism that they've had in all of that time. Had three sessions on apologetics, to be fair. So is the way that we run small groups likely to be whole life in orientation or is it not likely to be? Now, one of the things that we've tried to do around culture, because it can often seem to be very complicated and you know, completely daunting, and I do want to say that um, everything I'm saying today, or at least the, the, the framework for this, 
You can begin before you leave today. It costs no money, and you need no resources for it. The resources may help you, but you don't need them. Because this is an attitude of mind. This is a consciousness. And I want to show you how easy it is to begin to change this. So how does change occur? This is a very simple model, Beckhard Harris change model. And we, we've used it with local churches because local churches are usually not places where everybody's got a change, a change, a culture change expert sitting in the congregation. I mean, maybe in some of the big ones you do, and that's great, but most places don't. So this is D times V times F needs to be greater than R, where D is dissatisfaction. If nobody is dissatisfied, you cannot change it. So if the theological college has got lots of students, no one is interested in changing anything. If the church is growing, look, the Lord is blessing us, and he is. So why do we need to change? Why do we need to integrate this? Look, how, look what's going on. It's fantastic. Yes, it is fantastic, but your vision's not big enough. And then you need some compelling vision. Because if you've got no compelling vision, why bother, even if it's awful? I can't see where to go. And then you need some doable first steps. And this applies almost to anybody, whether you're teaching a child to ride a bike or you're teaching somebody a computer, you're teaching something, anything. They need a doable first step, some easy way in, some way to begin. Otherwise, this is too big. How can I change the culture of the church? Oh, it's too big. And that needs to be greater than the resistance to change. And for the mathematicians amongst you, the reason for the multiply is that if any of those are zero, you get zero. So you can, you can say this is a problem until you're blue in the teeth, but if you've got no vision, nothing will happen. You can paint a utopian vision, but if people haven't got any next steps, it won't happen. So one of our key things is to help people discover what those little things in their own context. Now, we have examples of these little things that begin to help people, but it's much better always if the community work out what they are for themselves in our context, what are these little steps. So I'll give you some. We call them one degree shifts, because if you are flying from um, Sydney to London and you change your course by one degree, you end up in Paris. I'm not sure if that's true, but that's the idea. And that might be great for you. <laughs> um, so let me give you just a, f a few very quick examples of this. Uh, so a few examples. So here's a slide that you might put up on a, a behind a hymn. So you might have the, the words of a hymn if you project them with just the words up there. And then often you see with Christian hymns, it's certainly my culture, you get these beautiful pictures of nature. Lovely, absolutely gorgeous. And uh, here's another one. This is Australia. You see, I've, I've really connected this to the context here. Because <laughs> there's lots of, no, there's nobody on that mountain anymore, are there? But be thou my vision, and so on. And, you know, what does that say to us? Maybe that says the wrong thing because of the history of the you know, Aboriginal culture right now. It probably does say the wrong thing, so I apologize for that. But what it might say to people is we find God out there. We find God in nature, and, and we do. The heavens declare the glory of the risen Lord. It's absolutely true. And there's nothing wrong with those slides. But something different happens if you do this. Mm. Suddenly somebody thinks, oh, really? Or if you do that, and you go to some slightly less salubrious neighborhoods, mm -hmm. if you like. And that's Andrew Laird's kitchen, which is, so that's, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, his wife texted me that this morning to say, so, so he forgot again, and you're the reason. <laughs> and, uh, This is where Eugene was last night. Now, you don't know whether that's serious or not, do you? But, there you go. <laughs> but, but do you see what I'm trying to say? It's a tiny, tiny, tiny thing, but it totally reframes the idea of where we might get a vision for God. In this space, be thou my vision. Or you just put the logos of all the schools that your kids go to, you put be thou my vision on it. It just changes things, but it's tiny takes you five minutes. Let me give you another one that we've used a lot. I call this TTT. And these are just examples of how you do it. I mean, you don't, again, you don't have to end them. This, is, this time tomorrow. So you ask them, what will you be? You invite somebody for a two-minute interview in the middle of the service, on a Sunday service. At this stage, Sunday is important because Sunday is where the most important things happen in church. 
So you're validating something. So you invite somebody up and say, what do you do? Um, could be anything. I'm a fire person. Tell us, tell us about the challenges. Tell us about the opportunities. How can we pray for you? That's it. Or tell us how you see God working there. If they've got a story, then all of it's great. It takes two minutes. Now, um, I wonder what you think the benefits of that might be to a congregation. You might do it once a month. One church did it 24 weeks in a row. I don't necessarily recommend that. Well, the benefits are uh, extraordinary. It makes that person a hero to us. It makes their story valuable to us. It affirms other people who are on the front line, if you like, call them ambassadors for a moment, and it triggers new conversations. Oh, I didn't realize, gosh, I know, I'm not a fireman, but it feels just like being in theater as a nurse. You know, all that pressure and the timing and the danger and the jeopardy, yeah, it feels just like that to me, or whatever. It triggers new conversations. What you're trying to do is create a richer, rounder set of conversations that are intentional around mission in all of life. It does it. It doesn't do it on its own, but it does it. Or, um, I was talking to Murray, you could have an annual commissioning service, that's one church does, and they happen to use, this is Limington Baptist Church. It's a Baptist church, and it's in Limington. There you go. <laughs> Nothing particularly special about that. It's on the south coast, and um, they're a Baptist church, but they use an Anglican tradition, which is called Plough Sunday, which is the, the Sunday in the year when the plough is literally brought into the church, which in the British agricultural year would be January. It wouldn't be for you, obviously, but that's when it's brought into the church. And they pray that the Lord would establish the work of their hands and the, tech, and the technology they're using to plough up the ground. So it's the beginning of the economic cycle. Churches do harvest, but they don't do the beginning of the cycle. So at the beginning of the year, it's convenient. He gets people to bring in something that represents their front line, their workplace. So there's the plough. And you can't really see this, but over here, there's all kinds of things. There's some Nordic walking sticks. There's a, a mug. There's a camera mug. There's a, probably a, um, there's some materials which somebody uses for a particular uh, work that they do. There's a memory. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. So they brought stuff, and there's some football boots because a kid brought in their football boots because his football team, that's his front line. And so kids bring stuff in, and it's all at the front. And then they're commissioned. They're actually commissioned. Every year, they make they make a set of statements. Uh, and uh, they've got these little cards. They're very small. They're postcard size, which are at the front of the church. And you can write your story on a postcard. So it's not very long. And you hand it to the vicar, or not vicar, minister, and he reads them out when he gets them. Does he get one a week? No, I'd love to tell you he does. But it's a culture. It's a culture he's creating. And uh, these slides will be made, made available through a lead near you. One church, one lad, yeah, and that, <laughs> and there's the commissioning. Just, just you, you wouldn't necessarily have to use those words, and I'm not going to leave those up for long, but the point is he has them. So pe people have got these words in front of them. This is not a trivial thing. This is not, a, let's all stand up and pray. This is every year a formal, together we are commissioning one another for where we are, and there's a consciousness of where that might be. So... Um, that's the exit, it's a modest church. That's the exit, now is the time to worship. Uh, there you go, that's what that looks like and the church is leaving the building. And uh, there is, that's, it's, it's, it's not fancy and that's some of their mission board and so on and so forth and that's their, you can't quite see this probably but that's the outside sign and it says Limington Baptist Church meets here. It's quite clever. It's not Limington Baptist Church, service times. Limington Baptist Church, the people of God meet here. It's not the only place we are the church. And so, you know, um, the same applies, if you like, um, to all kinds of other things. So this is Paul Stevens, one of the great um, gurus, Regent College guy, but he was a pastor. And the way he did it in his church when he was a pastor, he'd walk around after the service and he'd ask people, so uh, what has God been... Uh, doing in your life this week and what's he been teaching you and he just keep on doing that and eventually people got the idea that he was going to come and ask them that question so the church emptied <laughs> 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 but it what's important that's the question it's, it, it's it's a different kind of how are you question it's still a how are you question but it's focused 
So um, imagine you're in a small group, and I'm sure you've all been in a small group, and then you think back to the last time that you had a prayer meeting, and, or rather somebody asked the question that every small group asks, which is, how can, we, how can we pray? Anybody got any prayer requests? So when this, the penny dropped on this was about um, three years ago for me, and I was in a small group, and I don't, I don't lead the group, um, but I have to own it. It's the group I'm in. I've got to take responsibility, so I'm not trying to deflect responsibility. It's the, I'm not saying it's the group leader you gave me, Lord. Um, and uh, so they asked the question, any prayer requests? Eight people, only two prayer requests. One of them was literally my 100-year-old aunt is not very well. Charlotte's aunt, and the other one was a workplace crisis. Great to pray for those things. No other prayer requests. Why not? Because we only pray for crisis. So there's a teacher in an urban regeneration school who's been praying for the regeneration of that school and for, you know, um, she, she teaches some of the parents uh, debt counseling, the Christian debt counseling course. She's taking him... Um, tablecloths to put on the tables, this is culture change, uh, in, in, in the dining room, so these little children, so it's quieter, so these little children learn that, who, who never sit around a table at home, learn that eating together is about conversation. I mean, this is a person with a real deep vision for the transformation of that culture and the reaching of those people for Jesus. And she hasn't got a prayer request. Because the culture is you only pray for pressure points. So most church small group praying is about pressure points and therefore it is short term and reactive. And of course we have to do that. So if you want to change the culture, and this is hard, you have to create purpose or mission or kingdom prayer as well. So you hold them together. Pressure point and purpose. Hard to do. Honestly, it's hard to do. Now let me give you a last example. And this is in a way is just to show you in a sense that it's a mindset. Um, and so almost anything, when you start thinking this way, can be uh, used in this way. So um, let's think of the coffee rotor. Anybody got a coffee rotor in their church? Anybody serve coffee or tea or I don't know what? I don't know. Insects in water. I mean, what do you do here? Morning tea. Thank you. So anyway, you have a morning tea. That's very good. Thank you for the language. By the time I get to Brisbane, I'll be fluent in Oz. You say roster, not rotor. Yeah. Okay, can, we, can you all write down all the mistakes I've made in language? <laughs> by, the time, by the time I get to Wumba, I'll be... No, it's too much, I know. By the time I get to Wumba, I'll be fluent. So, so anyway, the coffee roster. So um, what's that got to do with mission? So anyway, the, in my previous church, the only thing they allowed me to do was the coffee roster. Once every six weeks, they let me make the coffee and serve the coffee. Fantastic. And because it was England... Uh, tea was involved, and there was a whole set of instructions on the inside of a white melamine cupboard in the kitchen. It was an A4 sheet of paper, black and white. This is the job description. Come out of the service at this time, put the urn on. Come out of the service at this time, 10 minutes before, to check that the water is boiling. Put the biscuits on the plates, but do not open them until the service is over for health and safety and hygiene reasons. You can't do that. Can't do that. And then, under no circumstances, pour the water over the tea until you're absolutely certain that this is the very last verse, the very last time they're going to sing it, of the final hymn. Otherwise, people will have stew tea and no one will ever come back to this church again <laughs> because we have very high spiritual priorities in Britain. So that was the job description, and then there was some instructions about how to do the dishwasher because it was a rather old thing, and it was actually, particularly for some person, technically challenged, slightly complicated. Anyway, so that was it. Is that the job? Is that the job? No, that's not the job. The job is there's a load of people coming along, and you're going, oh, you know, Alice doesn't look very happy today. I wonder what it is. Maybe I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was because. Um, Carton lost against Melbourne on Sunday. Maybe, maybe that's it. So let, let's let's get let's get let's get Shannon over. Shannon, go find out what's wrong. Or somebody else is coming through, and you think, oh, 35 years old, no ring on his finger. I know exactly who I'm going to introduce him to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's front line of pastoral care in a sense, isn't it? Well trained people. It's the front line of pastoral care. You can't talk to anybody any more than the barista can for for half an hour, but you can focus on some people a bit. That's the job. And some people are really good at that job, and some people can be trained to be better at it. Now, supposing you're training people to be good at that job, and you're a whole life disciple-making missional church. So you do the training, 
But the next thing you do is you say, so now tomorrow you're going to the school gate. So when you get to the school gate, you do exactly the same thing. You look around and you say to God, who do you want me to talk to? Who looks really upset? Whose eyes are down? Who's really, really chirpy? But you want me to go talk to them because actually there's something going on for them. So you've trained people to, to read, to be sensitive to the spirit, to go where God might want them to go. And that's what they do. Or they go into the workplace. And so, you know, in my case, I might come in and, you know, Gemma's not looking great today. And I say to my PA, Pippa, do you want to just go find out if Pippa's okay? Because she, sorry, Gemma's okay? Because you don't have to tell me, but just check, could you? That's what you do. So what you, even the chores, <laughs> even your rosters, all of those things can be turned to missional training when you think this way. It's about thinking this way. Your, your incidental conversations change, your slides change, the, the, the asides change, and of course the big thing is to go and visit people. That's the big one. If you visit people, that's the big one. So three habits, then I'll stop. Um, here's the coffee. The meeting place is the learning place for the marketplace, so you learn in the church. So here are three habits of highly fruitful whole life disciple making partners, pastors. First of all, they read the Bible differently. The text is key. The text is key. And uh, without going on too much about this, the reality is that the reason we're in this mess is because our hermeneutics have been deeply flawed and affected by the sacred secular divide. So we know this because work has on the whole not been preached globally very well, or hardly at all. And yet it's a major central theme all through the Bible. So we know this. Because nobody is asking the preachers to preach something that's not there. We're asking people to see what is there and preach it. Because there is selective perception, selective enthusiasm, and selective application. So there is a hermeneutical challenge here. So over time, people will begin to read the Bible differently. And then they will have different conversations. And they'll go to different places. The number one thing that we've found that helps church leaders or fuels, empowers, shapes, strengthens church leaders to do this well is to go visit people wherever their front line is. Once a month, so. Can't do it for everybody, of course. Not everyone will, wants you there. Not, and you can't necessarily go into you know, the Australian intelligence service to, uh, you know, just walk in. But that single thing radically reshapes the relationship with the people and your own sense. Oh, it's like this. Oh, I see. You sniff it. You see a magazine and it's plastic extrusion weekly or widget monthly. And you, you pick it up. You see what people are wearing. You, 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 you sense whether the place is toxic or welcoming or whatever. And because you're there, because you're there, you, you see things and you ask questions. I remember going to somebody's office and he was, happened to be, it's not the only sort of person, he happened to be the CEO of a manufacturing company. On his office wall, there was this picture of a rubber dinghy going through some rapids with a load of people on it. It was a sort of cartoon. I said, what's that? He said, that's the senior team and that's how we're feeling right now. <laughs> we're in this rubber dinghy, we're being carried along and it's pretty hairy. Well, I don't get that by sitting at home. And it begins to fuel what we see in the text as well. So those are the three things, and I'm going to stop.